Real quick, just the About Me uh, stuff. Uh, this is not going to be a deck-heavy thing. We're going to look at a lot of code. So um, I'll, I'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, uh, my name's Jeff. I'm an engineering manager at Angie. I, uh, my team handles third-party integrations. Uh, previously worked at Microsoft, Olo, Insurance.com, many startups, um, many of which failed. Um, so I have lots of great examples of what not to do um, in dot-com businesses. Uh, you can find me on the gram. Uh, that's my GitHub. Um, my biggest uh, uh, um, open source project is, is a form application that's written in .NET. Um, and uh, the source for this thing that you're going to see today is at that URL there. So you can download that and look at it to your heart's content. I'll leave that up there for just one second if anybody needs to get it. All right. So here's our agenda. Like I said, most of this is going to be code. We'll have a couple of uh, a couple of slides to where you're going to be blabbing, and then after that, we'll get into it, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So what is Blazor? Uh, it is the .NET implementation of WebAssembly. Um, if you are not affiliate, uh, uh, familiar with WebAssembly, it is a real live standard that is supported in all of the browsers um, that essentially acts, uh, I would say it's kind of like the, the, the bytecode binary intermediate thing that, uh, that .NET does or Java does, but it's intended for the browser. So it's sandboxed um, and it's essentially, uh, it's, it's compiled, if you will, um, uh, for browsers. Uh, the .NET impl implementation uses uh, Razor, which all of you are probably familiar with if you work in .NET, uh, as far as the uh, um, uh, markup goes. So uh, the controls that you'll see in this are, are should be pretty familiar in that in that sense. Um, it does have a server rendered mode as well. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Are you going to make them available? Or do I need to have yes, yeah, I will. I will make them available. Sure. Um, uh, so anyway. I, uh, Server rendered code is available through this as well. The next version is also going to have some kind of weird hybrid mode that magically knows when to download stuff to your browser or stream it from the uh, server. It, it works. I've seen demos of it. It's pretty impressive. Um, but that's supposed to come in .NET 8. Uh, this is appropriate for making uh, single page applications that are talking to APIs in the same way that you would do a, uh, a, a Angular or React um, uh, or Vue.js um, application. Um, I think that the, the patterns are similar in that if you've worked in any of those things, you know that there's generally a, a hierarchy of, of uh, uh, controls, components, whatever, you, whatever trip, depending on the framework, um, and you compose those and use shared state, et cetera, to make an application that then talks to uh, an API in the back end. Um, the component model is, is key to this, uh, just as it is on in any of these other framework or any of these libraries. I'm told don't call them frameworks, but they, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, these libraries, these front-end libraries that you're used to, um, I've, I'm not an expert in any of them. I'm not an expert in this, so ha, <laughs> look what you walked into. Um, but uh, this, uh, I think, is closest to, from what I understand, is the way that Vue.js works, which is the only one that I have any little bit of experience with, and I can, I can testify that's probably true. Um, just enough, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm enough to be uh, uh, dangerous. This can use .NET libraries, and that's the magic here, right? Like, if you have stuff that you're used to using, um, and it, most of it, as long as it follows, it falls in the .NET standard classification, uh, and if you aren't familiar with those, definitely look that up. There's a difference between uh, framework versions and standard, .NET standard. .NET standard tends to run across all different platforms, um, but if you have libraries that, that fall into that bucket, you can use them on the browser, which is crazy stuff. So for example, anybody ever use uh, ImageSharp library? Um, resize, manipulate images? You can run that in the browser, and it works. <laughs> so can, if you can imagine like you have some thing where you do normally uh, some server-side thing of resizing an image, for example, you can do that in the browser with the same library. It's, it's fantastic. Um, my first experience with uh, uh, Blazor was this thing that was playing the music that you heard when you came in. Uh, this is another open source project I have. It's called mLocker. Um, this was born out of, um, by the way, that's also on the GitHub there. Um, this is a personal music cloud that I built. So you're like, why the hell would you do that? There are, that's a solved problem, right? Yeah, totally it is. However, if you started with your 8,500 MP3s in the Amazon system ecosystem, and they're like, yeah, we're not going to host those for you anymore, even though you've been used to doing that for 10 years or whatever. Um, so they yanked that out from under me. And I'm like, oh, cool, Google's doing the same thing. I'll just move it all over there, rebuild all my playlists. And then Google's like, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore either. So I realize most of the kids, you're using Spotify. I understand, right? But 
I, I like to, to own stuff. Like I, I want to always have that music. And some of it is also stuff that you is not going to be on Spotify. If you're into like collecting, you know, bootlegs or concert recordings or you know stuff that just you can find on the internet, but it ain't on Spotify. So I have stuff like that that I wanted to own, right? So I'm like, screw this. I'm going to make my own thing. Um, no best practices in this. So if you do go, go look at the the uh, source for this, don't pretend like, oh, that's how you build these. No. It's me trying to hack together something that essentially works. Um, however, when I built that thing, since then, as of this morning, I have streamed 35,402 songs through that, through that system. So it totally works. <laughs> and uh, it actually runs in the background on my phone with it locked on Android. Um, caveat, it won't work on iOS, because if you've ever done iOS uh, st or any uh, mobile um, Safari stuff, Apple does not let you automatically play stuff via JavaScript. It has to be a user-initiated thing, like they have to touch something, which is super annoying. That's going to change, though, right? Because now the EU says that they can't force Chrome to be Safari underneath. I don't know if you know that. Chrome is actually Safari on iOS. It's just the rendering engine's all there. So that's going to change because the EU says you can't do that. So um, yay for that. Those, that'll be a better day. Uh, like I said, it runs in the background uh, on Android, um, iOS not so much. Um, the music is all in Azure Blob Storage on the back end. There's a very tiny little API that just serves up songs in the playlist. Um, and then the rest of it's all front end code. So, yes, sir. Uh, my, my library costs about two bucks a month in storage. I don't remember what the, like, the number of gigabytes is, but it's, I mean, you know, it keeps getting cheaper every, every year too, so it's not a lot. Like, so I pay two bucks, which is less than you know, you'd pay whoever. I mean, you can't. I can't listen to anything I want, but I use. I'm pretty picky, so I buy my own stuff anyway. So, um, anyway, I can show you that later if we have time. But I'm. I timed it, and we probably won't. Um, so anyway, so then I'm. I'm bored because I want to do a word. I want to build a word game, and why? Because Wordle. I played it this morning. Did anybody else get it this morning? No. Three. How many tries? Yeah, I got three today too. So all right, right on. Um, <laughs> I'm glad because if you got if you got less than that, I was going to feel embarrassed that I asked you. So, uh, um, uh, so anyway, so th there came some uh, came up with some dumb rules and and they evolved. I put it in front of some friends, or whatever, and it basically evolved into Hangman. So, <laughs> the the game is essentially Hangman. And if you played that when you were kids, probably you know where you put the little dashes on the board or right right and you figure out the letters, whatever. Um, the uh, uh, the trick is, or the, the reason, or the intention is, is that you want to play it because you want to have the best rank against other people. Uh, so you do you play your game on a single day. There's one a day. The next day you come back and say, "Cool, what was my rank?" And it ranks you on uh, first the number of guesses you made, and then the time. So like everybody who had zero guesses, the first place has the shortest time, etc. Then you go to the people who had one one letter guess, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, and that shows you where you are. At one point, I had about 200 people. Um, who were playing this? Because I like you know told people at work that it was there. Now it's down to like somewhere between 30 and 40 or 50. So play today because we'll see how we'll see what we can get that number up to. Um, you got one puzzle a day. Again, I don't want to consider this best practices, but it's probably closer because at least this time when I built this, I kind of understood what I was doing. Kind of. Uh, it has changed a little bit in the way that you float can float properties up and down the uh, um, component. Uh, chain. There are easier and better ways to do that. There are also new ways to do um, bindings. I'm not going to go deep into the bindings, um, which are, if you're familiar with any of those other front end frameworks, it's just the idea that you have this thing and it's bound to this data. When it changes, it's observable and the other thing changes. Um, that's the biggest change in the last one. Um, you can play it right now at phrasey.net if you'd like to. Um, we're going to do it on the screen too, but you know, if you want. All right. You ready? All right, let's play it. We'll play it together. Oh, I forgot the bandwidth is awesome. So this live demo here. All right, there we go. All right, so um, I played yesterday. I was third place is what you can see there. What was that? Ooh, we have a question today. Um, give me a letter. What do you want to start with? E. e. Time, clock's ticking. E. What? T. T. Uh, slow, slow down. We, the idea is to have the least guesses. Anybody know it yet? What else? Oh. 
Who knows what that's from? War games. War games. Man, if somebody had known, I was going to feel stupid old there. You remember Matthew Broderick, right? When he was a kid? Ali Sheedy? Oh, man, did I have a crush on her for that movie. Um, anyway, uh, so you just, saw, you just saw the whole game uh, unfold there, and uh, obviously this is formatted a little nicer, you know, if you were looking at it on a phone. Um, I wanted you to point out a couple of things just in terms of the, uh, in terms of the game board here. Um, if you see there's uh, these little things, those are your guesses, um, and then these letters here are the keyboard. Uh, obviously, this would, on a touch surface, the, you would put, be pushing those. Um, and then the timer is there. Uh, there are some other things that pop up that we can look at if we, if we want to get uh, step into the code. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't, did anybody notice the little animation when these popped up? They did a little twirly thing? Okay, cool. That, that's important because we're, we're going to we're gonna get to that. So, uh, All right, so that, that's the game. Uh, and surprise, you all know the answer. Um, so when you get it, uh, you all should get it in zero guesses. Let's look through the uh, actual, there's, there's four projects here. Can everybody see that? I don't know if I can make that bigger or not. Um, anyway, start with uh, the client is the actual WebAssembly piece. Uh, Azure functions, there's one function. It's the thing that runs overnight to say, calculate who the winners are. Uh, there is the server, which has the API, which is just a couple of endpoints. I'm not going to go into that. Everybody's done a .NET API. We're not going to talk about that here. Um, it is also hosting for simplicity, it's hosting the, uh, the web client as well. Um, and then a shared library. Um, shared library just basically has um, a couple of things. It has the API paths so that they can be shared uh, it, as defined in the, API, in, the, uh, in the API as well as in the, uh, in the client. Um, don't ever do that for real apps. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm serious, because if you, especially if you work with other teams, the problem is, is when you do this, now every time that you are want to change that, and you have somebody else consuming your API, they need to get this library that they now depend on. And if it changes, they need the new version of that library. So don't ever do this. <laughs> this is for convenience inside of this. Um, and then there's a couple of shared models, same thing, right? Like when you build against an API, make sure that it's the serialization mechanism can degrade gracefully, right? So if you add a field to one of these, one of these uh, methods, whatever is consuming it from the API should be able to tolerate that. Now, the opposite is not true. If you take things away, obviously that'll break it, but uh, don't do that either. Um, so let's get into the actual client then. Um, let me make sure that I'm uh, doing the right thing here. Okay, yeah, let's talk about the state first. So the state of this thing is something that is going to be uh, you know, held in the browser and relatively constant. These different properties are uh, very much what they say. The one thing that I am doing, just because I know people will open up their dev tools and they'll be like, oh, look, there's the solution, right? Because it's, it's, all, it's all right there, like you can look at it. Um, but uh, what I do is then is I, I just uh, uh, encode with, as in um, uh, base64 encode the actual word or phrase, right? So if you look at it, I mean, it's not encrypted, but you can't just look at it and be like, ah, oh, I got the answer, blah, 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 you know? So you can't cheat in that way. The rest of the things in there, however, are, are Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, you've got the, the key states, the keys, all of the, it's just an array of those, you know, the, the, the letters, right? Um, the uh, letter boxes, uh, which are the, you know, the actual, the, the, the Wheel of Fortune board, if you will, because you notice it's even yellow and green. Um, uh, uh, you, your guess records, how many, which stores what you've guessed, uh, your results, is it in solve mode, is the game over, how many seconds are you at, so yeah. This, you, if you come back to it, the time has elapsed, right? Whether you were there or not, it has elapsed um, because we still have the timestamp in there. And yeah, you can cheat that, cheat that too. Um, and then the actual puzzle definition, which is what it looks at uh, or what it grabs from the server. So the reason I point all of this out is that all of this stuff can be serialized and it is serialized once a second. <laughs> um, basically, once the timer starts, it just saves that state once a second and it, stays, it's, it saves it in... Um, uh, in, uh, what do you call it, um, local storage. So um, if you look at the local storage thing, this is like super simple. Um, Blazor has something called uh, JavaScript interop, right? So in other words, you are sitting in the browser, so you have access to all the JavaScript things. One of the JavaScript things is local storage, and the, the methods to call lo local storage are set item and 
git item, that's it. <laughs> so there's no, there's no script that I wrote there, I just literally call the thing and then give it the, uh, give it the value that I wanna call. So does that make sense? It's, it's, you know, it's like writing anything else in, in JavaScript, but it's, it's local browser stuff. Um, local, local storage, gotta use the right term there. So once you have the state, that means that you have to have a, uh, an engine that is going to kind of tie all these things together, right? So the, en the engine is the, essentially the, uh, it is the, the meat and bones, or the, is the meat of the entire um, game. I'm not gonna go through all of the methods there, you're welcome to look at that, but I do wanna point out two important things. The first thing is that you have a number of actions there, okay? Um, actions are, uh, if you've never used them, well you have used them, whether you wrote them or not, you've used them in any kind of uh, UI model, right? Because you have to um, essentially hit your, hit your ride, so to speak, to an event happens with this thing, so run this code, right? So um, you've probably used anonymous delegates, they're the same thing, it's just that they're inline, right? Um, so that we have a number of things that happen on key press, on solve mode change, on wrong solve, on dialogue open, on board load, and on start game. So all of those things are associated with controls, uh, or I'm sorry, components that you're gonna see in, in a minute here. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll go through one example so you can kind of see through how those work. The game state is that model that we just looked at. Um, uh, the last result payload is basically that response that comes back, remember it said, you know, where, where, how you scored last time, that's stored there. Um, uh, choose letter, I don't remember what that does. Um, start starts the game, toggle solve mode, solve, uh, solve backspace, and open dialog, those all do exactly what you think they do just because of the names. Um, naming is the hardest thing in software, right? Um, so any questions about that? Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna get into the, to the, to the uh, meat of this. Oh, important pr part here, okay. So you've all done a dependency injection, yes? Okay, so for those of you who have not, uh, dependency injection is where you take a, uh, uh, just the interface of something and you define it and you associate it with this implementation and then you inject it into other classes that, that will consume it, right? So we have this, this game engine as a, single, as a singleton in the entire app, so everything talks to it, right? So it, it is, it's injected into these components and it's injected just as, the same way that it is in any Razor um, thing. You're not, it's controversial about whether or not you should be injecting dependencies directly into a Razor view. But I mean, a lot of times there's good practical reasons to do it, I think, so uh, like for formatting and stuff like that. I mean, you could format it at some other level, like an MVC, you can format it in the controllers, I guess, or something else, but whatever. I'm, I'm not, I am not dogmatic about anything. And that's probably why I'm a manager now, because I'm not dogmatic about it enough. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, this, uh, uh, this one instance of this, uh, of this class then appears everywhere that needs to talk to it. And that's gonna be important in, in a, for uh, reasons you'll see in a minute. Any questions there? All right, let's talk about how we talk to the server. Blazor underneath is actually using uh, the JavaScript infrastructure to call uh, uh, the server, uh, which is important because you have to understand what limitations that comes with, right? There's only so many things that the browser can do. So when you fire up an HTTP client, uh, you are actually talking uh, to um, to the uh, underlying um, uh, uh, the underlying fetch mechanism of the browser in JavaScript, and I re I bring that up, I bring that up because um, in that uh, music player that I had, genius me is like I'm going to just upload all 8,500 songs at one time. Let's see the browser do it, right? No, <laughs> uh, Chrome grows to take whatever memory you have and then some until it finally dies. Uh, it, it's I got it up to, on my home machine, to 28 gigs or something like that. So you think, you, you think Chrome's bad, you know, test it that way. I, I actually filed a bug uh, uh, with, the, with the Blazor repo. They looked into it, they're like, well, because it uses that implementation, that's not our problem. Uh, they pretty, pretty much pawned it off on them. They did, but however, we did run a test on Firefox at the time, and this is two years ago. Firefox handled it it eventually, like you would see, it would build up and then it would release some memory and then it would build up and then it would release memory. So apparently Firefox does better garbage collection than, <laughs> than Chrome does, or did, at two years ago at least. Um, so anyway, so this, so this is, uh, but again, if you've used, uh, it's not if, when you've used HTTP client on, in .NET, it's the same syntax, it's all the same stuff. It follows the same async await patterns, uh, it has the same uh, method signatures, it's all of that stuff. But like I said, underneath it, it is mapping it to the JavaScript mechanism itself. So that comes with whatever limitations there are there. Um, uh, there are only, by the way, what is it, two, 
three methods, uh, get puzzle identifier with identifier, put results, and get, less, get last result with identifier. That's it, three, three API endpoints. Um, this might be a good point to, or a good place to tell you, as far as the identification is, it drops a GUID on your machine and that's your identifier. That's the only thing I know about you. Um, so I can see from day to day when you come back the next day and you get your results, that's how it knows it's you. You don't have to sign in or anything and uh, frankly, I don't care who you are, so I'm not gonna ask you. Yes? Yeah, we just have uh, one on the desktop. Yeah, we just did. Well, I mean, it is on the web, yeah, but I mean, it's in the browser, so browser, any browser. Um, and then the, uh, the, the back end, of course, obviously, whatever you're running on, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a .NET Core uh, web app. Yeah. I don't know what the actual mechanics are. I would assume that it does that. Um, what I think, it, 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 well, the good thing is you could look at the source code, interestingly enough, and that'd be kind of interesting to see. My guess is what it does is underneath HTTP client is it's changing it to, or it's writing out whatever uh, uh, JavaScript interop would, that would be. Um, that's a good question, but the good, cool thing is we could find out if we looked. <laughs> um, that's what's so great about these days, right? Remember when, you know, .NET was a black box and it worked, but you didn't know why, and then when it didn't work, you were pissed because you couldn't explain it. Well, now if it doesn't work, you can be like, I can look at the source code and find out why it doesn't work, and then tell them it doesn't work and why. So, yay for open source. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, I, I would imagine that's what it does. That's a good question. I'm curious, I'll have to look. Yeah. So, um, with like typical like front-end frameworks, it's very like component-driven development, like very much like component, like everything is component, some interaction. That, that's a good question. I, I think, and what I've seen from other examples, what I've tried to learn from and how I built this from the things I learned from, is that if you were to think of this almost as a, um, any of the front end, uh, or not front end, any of the like desktop things, like the old like WPF and stuff like that, if you think about that, you've got, you've got your presentation layer, right? And then you've got whatever classes that to do all the things, like you would build a, like you would build any stateless web app. Um, and I think this is kind of the same thing. Um, so, because we're about to look at some actual components, and the components are all wired into again that those series of events. So, the, the game, the game engine is what they all talk to. They talk to, they look at its properties, and they bind to its properties, and they talk to those events. So, it'd be like the object is a component. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, let me, I'm trying to think of a, a good way to end it. So this is the fun point where all of a sudden the GoPro uh, camera locked up on me and froze. So I don't have any voice over, over the rest, so I'm just going to wing it and probably make this a little shorter for you. So what we were looking at there was we were looking at the three endpoints to call uh, at the server, and there only are three of them. The first one is get puzzle with identifier. Uh, the second one is put results, and the last one is get last result with identifier. Uh, and those, like I said, uh, those do the things that the names imply there. I was talking here a little bit about organizing your code and how you would normally have service uh, classes. Those are usually places that you're putting the code that does things while the repositories are typically separate. Um, and in this case, I was calling a repository basically directly by doing the uh, local storage thing. So. Uh, and that's totally okay too. Uh, don't feel like you have to, you know, follow those rules or be super dogmatic about it. So let's look at the actual uh, page. Um, the this is the uh, control that shows the uh, specific uh, layout of all the things. If you go back to the uh, way that the board looked, um, we stop there at, or we start rather at the top. Uh, we've got the little icon there after the page title. Uh, we have the info modal, which of course lays on top of everything, so you can put that anywhere. Uh, the phrase board, which is the Wheel of Fortune sound looking thing, uh, and then uh, the message row, which either will have a cancel solve button or game over if you get to the end. Then the timer, which you saw ticking when we were playing, and then the score trail, the little squares that appear uh, over the uh, keyboard that indicate your guesses, and then the actual keyboard itself is at the bottom. Next up, we look at the keyboard, and the markup for this should be pretty obvious, I think. Uh, what we've got on that keyboard is 
uh, a series of three rows and keys. Uh, each one of those keys there are uh, a subcomponent. So if you noticed, the naming convention, of course, is it just matches the, uh, the file names there uh, of those different components that are there in the shared folder. So you can see each one of those is, is, has a property there that we've defined called letter, and we just define or we put the actual letters in each of those. So going ahead then and looking at the actual key component, uh, it's going to start with a little bit of markup. It's just a button, nothing s special or interesting about that. And then a code block. So if we look at the code block top to bottom, the first thing that's there is that letter property that we defined. Uh, the second thing is what happens when it initializes. We'll get back to that. And then uh, on parameter set is not necessary. I could probably get rid of that there. Uh, and then a click event. That first line was a hack because for whatever reason, I think it was on iOS, I was getting uh, a, a focus set on, a, on some other part of the board and put a white border on it, drive, it drove me crazy. So I wanted to get rid of that. So the real thing is the one after that, we've got the game engine there, uh, uh, where it calls, calls the tr choose letter uh, option there. What I was doing here at the time though, is, is I'm showing you that uh, the button has an on click uh, event. And so we bind that click handler to the action of clicking that button uh, in the UI. Um, and like I said, the first, forget the first thing in there, but then the second thing is choose letter. If you go back to the interface that we showed in the game engine, you'll see that that does, you know, the code said, does what the method says that it does. And of course the letter was set there in the, in the actual markup. So, uh, if we push the R, then R is what, um, is, is the letter that's passed through to the game engine. Uh, looking at the top, there's a couple other things you might find interesting. You notice that for the class, uh, uh, the CSS classes, we have uh, a game engine property right there uh, where we're looking at that array of uh, key states that was in the uh, thing. Uh, and that key state uh, is going to be either gray or red or green. I forget what the specifics are. Uh, you look in the CSS file, you can see that. Um, and then also the style. Uh, if the game is over, uh, we don't want these buttons to show the hand, the, you know, the, the clicky uh, uh, icon or cursor. We want it to be default, which is just a regular arrow. So what happens is when the game is over, uh, that property is set and changes the cursor uh, style there. Uh, interestingly enough, the other thing that happens is, is in that on initialized, you'll see that I've associated a uh, some code with the on key press event of the game engine. So when that's called, uh, everything uh, that is subscribed or or added to that on key press event uh, gets fired. And in this case, it's just the state is changed method which is in the base of the Razor component uh, uh, class. And what that does is, is in this case, it will re-render uh, the UI, whatever is in that particular piece of UI. So uh, that varies. That's one way that you can update it. Obviously, you can also do uh, binding. There's a binding syntax, and I didn't go over that in the talk, but you can look at that at, at another time as well. So I expected to spend a little more time talking about the component structure. And if you're familiar with Again, any of those front-end JavaScript frameworks, that's going to be pretty familiar to you in terms of the pattern, the design pattern. Uh, but there were some questions also about what happens and what actually gets downloaded. So we went on a little tangent here and broke up in the uh, developer tools so we can actually see uh, the network traffic as we uh, do a reload on this. So uh, the first time, and, and keep in mind the bandwidth was not great on the guest Wi-Fi there at the, at the session. Um, so you'll see the first couple things come down are, are pretty obvious things. You've got the CSS. Uh, you see uh, blazor.webassembly.js. That is the thing that is essentially uh, starting and bootstrapping the process of loading the WebAssembly code uh, into the browser. Uh, and then some other things there uh, that are may or may not be important to you or, or meaningful even. Um, uh, the only two things that you would see uh, at the end that were user called code was the part at the end there where it's uh, uh, calling with that GUID. I forget what the URL is there, but you can see those are actually fetch commands. Now, next thing we did is we went into the cache storage for the application tab, and we deleted uh, everything uh, in that cache uh, just so we could do a reload. And then you could see something that will be, I think, uh, eye-opening if you are a .NET developer, something that you've seen before. So when we delete that, and I was talking about it, there we go. <laughs> when we delete that, right click, there we are, delete. Okay, <laughs> now we're gonna go back to the network tab and then we're gonna do another hard reload and I want you to watch all the things that appear here.
All right, there you go. See, that's super familiar to a .NET developer. You recognize those namespaces. Those are .NET assemblies that are loaded um, into the uh, browser to run as uh, uh, WebAssembly bits. Um, they are, again, loading a little slow because of the bandwidth there in the, uh, in the, at the college in that classroom. On the guest Wi-Fi, uh, but yeah, so you see things in there like you know system .dll or or system uh, .net .http .json. You know like those are all things that you have seen before and used in your uh, typical you know developer life. I wanted to point out at the also too at the bottom you see there it says 2.2 megabytes transferred. Uh, that's of course you know gzipped through the through the web server, um, but otherwise it would be 6.4 megabytes. That isn't too bad, and I wanted to make the case there to point out that uh, you know two megabytes for the first hit is going to come down pretty fast in normal uh, a normal condition, and then it's it's stored in the uh, uh, in that uh, browser's cache. So the next time you go to the site, you're going to see you know a, a reload of I think as you, if you looked earlier that was a couple hundred k at most, not very much. So that's what you would expect kind of going forward uh, whenever someone used this particular app. Uh, if two megabytes sounds like a lot, um, keep in mind that like if you go to any uh, newspaper or TV website to look at any article, you're going to see upwards of six, seven, maybe eight megabytes because of all the ads and trackers and all the things that they have in there for uh, for those crappy sites. Um, <laughs> it's it's not great, um, but whatever. Google doesn't seem to penalize them like you would think they would. Uh, so anyway, so that two megabytes is really not a, a big deal, and it shouldn't be, I think, a deterrent for using this particular platform. Uh, and also keep in mind that uh, the when you compile in release mode, what you'll get is you'll get just a subset of the things that it absolutely needs and it'll cut out everything else. So the actual download side in terms, size in terms of, uh, um, of uh, the different libraries that it'll pull down, that's gonna depend entirely on what you actually use and things you don't use will not be pulled down. So that's, that's a pretty great, um, great feature there. Uh, again, when you're doing, uh, now of course when you're doing it in uh, debug mode, you'll get all the things, uh, which is not a big deal, I think. So you'll see that if you, if you explore that. And that was basically the end of the talk. Uh, I had some qu good questions after that. Uh, I wish I could remember what they were for the purpose of this, but uh, I think next time I'll just have to use a better camera to make sure I'm recording all of this uh, and don't lose anything. But uh, it was a great talk, uh, I had a full, full room. Uh, fortunately, no, no one had to stand or sit on the floor. Uh, so if you were there, thank you very much for uh, attending. I really appreciate it. If you're just seeing this for the first time and we're not at Code Camp, um, I hope you enjoyed whatever uh, sessions you were in there. This was for the first one in the morning at 9.30. Um, uh, pretty bright and awake crowd for what we had, so I really appreciate that. It's good to be back amongst all the people, and uh, I hope you had a good time, and we'll see you next year at Code Camp.